Hey everybody, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And today, by request, I'll be talking to you a little bit about the Williamson Ether Synthesis. So the Williamson Ether Synthesis can be thought of as the reaction between an alcohol and an alkyl halide under basic conditions to create an ether. Now, what really goes on here essentially is we take the R groups from the alcohol and the alkyl halide and we join them to a bridging oxygen. So you can think of this as a way of combining the R group from an alcohol with the R group from an alkyl halide. So before we look at the Williamson ether synthesis itself, let's consider the two different reagents individually. Now alcohols are weak acids, which means that in an adequately basic environment, we can deprotonate them, removing that hydroxyl proton and creating something called an alkoxide. Now alkoxide ions are pretty good nucleophiles, especially compared to their neutral alcohol counterparts. So when we create an alkoxide ion, we expect it to attack any electrophilic site that it can get to. So naturally, if we have an alkyl halide, which is of relatively low substitution, say a methyl or a primary or maybe even a secondary alkyl halide, those particular reagents are primed to be attacked by a strong nucleophile by SN2 because they are not as obstructed on the back side of the carbon halogen bond. So when we have a situation where we can deprotonate our alcohol and we have an alkyl halide which is susceptible to nucleophilic attack, we can expect to make a Williamson ether product by SN2. So let's watch that happen now. Of course the first step in a Williamson ether synthesis is to generate your nucleophile from your neutral alcohol. We don't tend to store alkoxide reagents on the shelf because they don't last very long. They're pretty reactive and they tend to degrade over time. So let's say that we want to start with something like t-butanol to make a t-butoxide nucleophile. Well we need something that's pretty basic because remember that alcohol is a pretty weak acid, a pK of about 16. So I'm going to use a very common reagent that's used for this purpose and that is sodium hydride. Now, when sodium hydride reacts, it's as though hydride ion is the base, and that's a really, really basic species. So the reaction between the two generates hydrogen, which itself has a pKa of about 35, so it's very happy to form out of a hydride ion. And what's even better is this hydrogen will effervesce from the system because it's a gas. This makes the reaction completely irreversible because as the hydrogen evolves, and effervesces, it becomes unavailable to react. So now I've created sodium t-butoxide. This is going to be my nucleophile for my Williamson ether synthesis. So once I've generated my alkoxide ion, I expect it to attack any electrophile that it can get to. And in my example here, I've shown you methyl chloride as the substrate. Being a methyl uh, alkyl halide, Methyl chloride is extremely well suited to an SN2 reaction. There's really nothing obstructing our, our uh, alkoxide from attacking. So it will. And we'll go through an SN2 reaction, which will generate our T-butyl methyl ether and a halide ion as a byproduct. So this is an effective way of making T-butyl methyl ether. But remember, I said we can think of this as just switching R groups from an alcohol and an alkyl halide into the two R groups of an ether. So there's always two potential mixtures of reagents for any asymmetrical ether. So the question obviously comes up here is could we make t-butyl methyl ether using methoxide and t-butyl chloride instead? The answer is no, this is not a very good idea. And the reason, of course, is that that electrophilic carbon there, which I've colored for you in this sort of pinkish color, is buried pretty deeply in t-butyl chloride. And if I do a, a space filling model you'll see that there's really not a lot of room in there for a nucleophile to reach. That's a very tiny little target for that nucleophile to try to get to. And even a small nucleophile like methoxide simply can't get in there and attack and have a nucleophilic substitution. So what's going to happen instead? Well, as you can probably imagine, when you mix a SN2 prime nucleophile with an SN1 primed substrate, you end up with elimination because you've got those conflicting 
forces. So since our methoxide ion can't really access the back side of t-butyl chloride for a substitution, it's not going to wait around for a carbocation to form. Instead, it's going to act as a base. And in doing so, it's going to find itself an alpha proton to deprotonate and kick off that leaving group by that mechanism. So when it finds itself a good 180 degree dihedral to an alpha proton, it simply attacks that and removes the proton. And of course, the consequence of this reaction is that we don't create the desired ether, but rather we create the elimination product, an alkene. So whenever we are running a Williamson ether or trying to design a Williamson ether, we have to be careful to select the least substituted alkyl halide possible so that we don't promote this side reaction of elimination from taking place. So let's look at a few different potential ether products here and see if we can make them by Williamson ether. Let's start at the top with di-t-butyl ether. In this case, there are really only, or there is really only one set of reagents that I can use. Because they're both t-butyl groups, I'm going to make one of them the alcohol and one the alkyl halide. The problem is that in this situation I have a tertiary alkyl halide, which means that my Williamson ether synthesis will be extremely prone to elimination byproducts. So I wouldn't recommend making ditebutyl ether by Williamson at all. There's really no viable set of reagents that will allow us to do this. As another example, let's take the middle, t-butyl methyl ether. This is the molecule that we worked on today in our previous slides. There are two potential sets of reagents for me to consider. One is t-butanol and methyl chloride. We expect that this methyl substrate will react very well by an SN2 and therefore give us the desired product. The other potential set, of course, would be to switch the R groups around and try to use methanol and t-butyl chloride. However, if I do this, I'm again trying to use a tertiary substrate. So even though it may appear that this set of reagents is equally good at, uh, at forming this product by Williamson ether, it's in fact not. It will create much more of the elimination product. Finally, let's look at the example at the bottom. This is a great example because it's very easy. Here I have ethyl methyl ether. And in this case, it doesn't matter which I use because I can either have ethanol with a methyl chloride, meaning I have a methyl substrate, or I can reverse the order and run the reaction with methanol and ethyl chloride. And in this case, I'll have a primary substrate, which is also well suited for an SN2 reaction. So as you can see, the key to really understanding, predicting, and designing reactions with Williamson ether synthesis is to look very closely at the substitution of the alkyl halide. And of course, when we consider the alcohol, to think about how we're going to deprotonate the alcohol and do we have an adequately strong base to do such a thing. As long as you consider those things, you should be able to design just about any Williamson ether that you need. That's all for now, guys. I'm Professor Davis. See you next time.